everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us this afternoon. Hope that you guys are enjoying the last day of the conference and are excited for the wrap up. Um, so I'm here to talk to you guys uh, about spatial computing in Asia. So a specific focus on the Asia Pacific region and in particular on the Chinese market, which is where AWA Asia has historically been hosted. Um, so the sort of broad theme here for today is looking at the sort of pace of growth in China and some themes that we've seen um, in, the, uh, in the virtual and, uh, and uh, the VR and AR space uh, in China, particularly as far as government policy, both uh, things that enable and have facilitated the growth of XR uh, in Asia, as well as things that have perhaps slowed or created some complications for folks in the space. Uh, so uh, today we'll first, uh, I, I'm, I'm you know, interested in sharing a couple of uh, some highlights that we saw from AWA Asia in 2021. Um, so we had a great conference in Shenzhen. Uh, it was almost, you know, with, with the exception of some, you know, people wearing masks and sanitizing headsets, it really did feel like we had kind of come out of the pandemic in, in a real way in China. Obviously, things have changed a little bit since uh, last September, um, but uh, still, we've got some really interesting insights to share from AWA Asia in 2021. Um, some interesting surveys that we uh, that we posed to participants there, um, and then some. Uh, we also have some updates that have happened since uh, AWA Asia in 2021 that we think will be shaping things in 2022. Um, so just uh, as a quick overview as far as sort of general scope of the XR market in Asia. Um, so China alone represents about 56% of global XR expenditure in 2021. That's up 1.3% from 2020. And that's according to the IDC, the Internet uh, Data Corporation. 43.8% uh, uh, projected CGAR in XR spend from 2022 to 2026. We'll actually look at some specific figures on that in a second. Uh, and a total of $2.13 billion in uh, XR investments in China in 2021. Um, so you can see here, this is in billions of US dollars. So uh, we're uh, at uh, just over 2 billion in uh, investments in XR uh, in 2021. And we're expected by 2026 to be over $12 billion uh, in uh, total spending in the VR AR market in China. Um, of course, Asia is made up of more places than just China, but uh, seeing as that China is the host uh, country of the, uh, the AWA Asia show, I think this kind of gives you a sense of the size and the scope of the market that, uh, that hosts us. Uh, in terms of some the major brands that are driving some of this growth, um, so Chinese brands uh, are driving the you know do seem to be driving uh, the uh, shipments of uh, headsets uh, both in AR and VR uh, across the Asia the Asia Pacific region. Um, so these statistics are for the entire APAC region that includes uh, you know Japan, uh, the Greater China region, as well as uh, Australia and New Zealand. So Dapeng or DPVR uh, is currently at the top um, with 23.3% uh, expected market share, or excuse me, 21.8% market share in 2021. Uh, they you know, had 53% year-on-year growth uh, that year. Um, but we've seen a pretty rapid rise um, in uh, you know, very rapid year-on-year uh, -year growth from Meta and ETE. Um, so Meta in particular uh, seems to have uh, benefited uh, quite a bit from, uh, the, you know, from, from increased Quest 2 sales, uh, in particular in Japan, South Korea, and Australia. Um, however, Meta's ability to sell into China is a bit more limited. You do have a lot more domestic, uh, domestic providers that have, uh, that have you know, ad adopted a more dominant uh, position in the market, in particular DPVR, Pico, ETE, and also some other providers like Shadow Creator and MoVision as well as Pico, of course. Um, so um, one thing that I think we can also kind of, uh, one thing that I think is interesting here um, is uh, just how quickly um, the year-on-year -year growth has accelerated, particularly for ETE. Um, they are traditionally, have, uh, their sort of core business model is uh, a streaming app. Um, so sort of like a, a version of Netflix in China. Um, so we've seen them enter the, uh, the VR headset space as well, um, and they've uh, you know, quite rapidly expanded. Um, so we, uh, we also, in AWA Asia in 2021, um, we uh, had a survey presented from HTC. Um, Alvin Graylin was one of our speakers. He's the uh, director of Asia for uh, the, uh, the Asia president for HTC. Um, and uh, he had uh, shared with us a survey that HTC has been doing uh, since October of 2018. Um, where um, they asked uh, a set of, uh, you know, a group of uh, VR users, particularly in the B2C space, asking them, uh, what do you use VR for? Um, and one thing that I think was interesting is that, you know, because this spans five years, you can kind of see the evolution of user preferences in China over time. Um, so you see that there is, you know, we're now up to about 44% of those surveyed um, who said that they use VR uh, for study purposes or for learning or educational purposes. Um, so a pretty stark and a pretty sharp increase from 2019. 
Um, and we're also seeing more people using uh, VR for socializing and for sports and exercise, um, up to 36 and 35% respectively. Um, I think that the one other sort of piece of this that was interesting that, that I wanted to share um, was um, VR users, uh, you know, we asked them, uh, what are you interested or what do you use VR for now and what would you like to use VR for? Um, so we had 59% um, of people in this survey said that they'd like to use VR more for virtual cinema, that they were interested in having uh, virtual concerts or virtual or movies um, that were VR enabled or that had some kind of VR immersive component. We thought that was pretty interesting and that there was a, a really quite significant gap um, between those who were interested in virtual cinema and those who, um, who you know, actually had access to those experiences. Um, I think this also probably has a, you know, a bit to do with the fact that virtual cinemas in, or you know, that, uh, that in-person cinemas in China um, were, you know, have had a lot of challenges um, in, you know, in resuming normal operations throughout the last couple of years. So just as you're seeing a sort of slowdown or some you know, interference with traditional big music festivals, uh, cinemas and movie screenings, you're seeing a, a sort of offsetting rise in interest in uh, using VR to uh, replicate or to, you know, to have those sort of uh, experiences that are are comparable to that. Um, on the B2B side, um, we had a, a similar sort of survey that we know where we asked questions uh, to the, the participants asking them what industries will you be applying VR to or what's your sort of indus industrial focus. Um, and uh, we, you know, this, this also went over a period of a couple of years. Um, so from, um, from 2019 into 2021, we still see that education and training is at the top. Um, and people are saying that that's the thing that they are using VR for the most in a B2B context. Um, second would be VR, VR arcades, theme parks, and cinemas. Um, you did see a, a decrease in that in 2020 because, of course, that you know things like LBEs uh, were uh, you know did have um, uh, LBE-based arcades did have you know, some limitations uh, in normal operation because of the pandemic. One thing that we also added uh, in 2020 to this survey um, was um, looking at uh, the use of VR in hosting and planning events um, and hosting large scale events. Um, so we, we saw that this, you know, as soon as this was added as one of the survey options in 2021, it, it immediately shot up um, to being in the top seven. Uh, the last question that we asked in the survey that I thought was interesting was um, the average size of the users in your VR B2B products um, or projects. Um, so a near majority um, were working with only one to 20 users and an outright majority were working with fewer than 50 users. So generally it seems like the B2B use or the enterprise use of VR in China is, you know, it certainly gravitates towards education and training or some kind of entertainment focus um, and that the number of users uh, tends to be below 50. Of course, this all is uh, parallel to the fact that you know, there's some exciting uh, developments as far as some of the enabling technologies behind uh, the metaverse. Um, so as of March of 2020, China's deployed 1.43 million uh, 5G base stations, uh, which represents 60% of the global total. Uh, the, Chinese, uh, the Chinese MITI, the, uh, agent, the ministry that's responsible for the deployment of 5G base stations, has actually set a goal for themselves to deploy uh, 2 million uh, base stations by the end of 2022. Um, and in China, we, we currently now have 480 million VR, or excuse me, 480 million 5G connected devices. Although, of course, not all of those devices are, in fact, 5G compatible, but that still represents 80% of the global total. So some highlights that we saw from a product release perspective at AWE Asia 2021. First, uh, Shadow Creator, which is one of the, which is a uh, a hardware provider that focuses on augmented reality devices, um, launched uh, the TG uh, VR headset. Um, we also saw Madgaze, which is a Hong Kong-based company, uh, launch the uh, Wave MR glasses. Uh, Lightin released um, a head-mounted display that was uh, optimized or sort of designed with swimming uh, in mind. So uh, they called this product the Hollow Swim. This was the first public demo of the product. Uh, we also saw HTC release this uh, study on the uses of VR and fitness. They commissioned a study with Beijing Sports University, where they found that uh, the um, uh, when VR was added to a fitness regimen, this actually increased retention uh, in some kind of exercise routine by four times or by four X. Um, and that we also saw um, the, uh, the uh, level of excitement for people to go to the gym increased by two and a half times if there was some kind of VR component added to their fitness routine. Uh, we also saw some new platforms in AR being released by Lenovo, Hisense, Baidu, and Shadow Creator. Um, and MoVision, which is a, an affiliate of Shadow Creator, it's an, it's a, uh, a, an ODM pro, uh, provider that sells uh, VR headsets, uh, so kind of up there with Pico and DPVR in terms of market share. Um, 
uh, Movision released uh, this uh, sort of concept of the uh, uh, VR world ecosystem. Uh, where essentially they're working with uh, overseas and global developers to, uh, you know, to attempt to localize their, uh, their VR apps, VR games, um, social applications uh, into MoVision's uh, uh, VR ecosystem so that they'll, they'll be sort of shipped uh, by default um, onto, uh, you know, onto uh, VR headsets that MoVision will be selling. Uh, lastly, SenseTime, which is a pretty widely known uh, name in uh, AI in China, uh, highlighted some developments that they made in AR navigation, uh, with particular focuses on large and complex interior spaces, places like airports, malls, and other spaces like that. So one thing that I thought was really interesting from AWE Asia 2021 was that, well, first, Every single person had to say the word metaverse at least 16 times. It was almost required that every speech had to, had to make reference to Snow Crash. Um, you know, this was you know, definitely sort of part of the, the, the toolkit for speakers. Um, but I think that as we you know, have kind of uh, adopted the, the sort of terminology of metaverse to describe the, the XR world, um, there, there is this particular question um, at stake when we talk about the metaverse in China. In particular, we all agree that the metaverse should be neutral, and we all agree that there is one metaverse. However, there does seem to be a lot of competition over whose kit and whose systems should be used. And there are some particular regulatory challenges and differences in the way that computers and software in general is regulated in China. So we had um, someone from IEEE who works on standard setting at IEEE and Yu Yuan um, speak to us about standard setting. Um, in particular for mobile AR, um, the uh, IEEE's uh, standard setting body on mobile AR, uh, we saw that five out of the six members of this newly formed committee were actually from Chinese companies or Chinese universities. So increasingly we've seen that Chinese companies and universities are taking a more active role in setting some of the rules of the game and setting some of the standards that are being used uh, in in sort of determining how uh, you know, standards for interoperability and standards for uh, deployment for uh, mobile AR and VR technologies. We've also seen a sort of commercial battle for platform and kit dominance. So just in the last year in China, and we saw this at AWE Asia 2021, uh, the, Huawei 3, the Huawei AR VR engine 3.0 uh, engine was released. Baidu's Dumix AR 7.0, they had a sort of reboot of that. Um, AR, or excuse me, Oppo's AR unit is out there now. Uh, Shadow Creator uh, released the Tesseract OS, um, which is based on OpenXR. Uh, Hisense, Hi AR Space 2.0, and Lenovo's Daystar. So those were just platforms that were announced or discussed in at AWE, AWE Asia 2021. Um, but that's uh, that kind of gives you a sense of just how much sort of active competition there is just between Chinese brands um, in serving as the engine or sort of serving as the host of uh, metaverse experiences. So on the policy side. Um, we've seen some heavy-handed industrial policy. It would be kind of like if the U.S. government decided that Detroit is now VR town. Um, so we've seen uh, a couple of things that I think are really notable in the last year. The first is that China has actually stated that the development of the VR AR industry is a national public pol policy priority. That was announced in the 14th five-year five plan in 2021. Um, there is an older body uh, called the Industrial Virtual Reality Alliance, which is a Chinese public-private association that was founded, I believe, in 2017. Um, but since the term metaverse has kind of uh, sort of expl you know, it's exploded in, in, in use uh, in the last year, we've seen three separate government organizations uh, start that were uh, start up in the last year. Uh, They're specifically dedicated to um, uh, the metaverse and specifically dedicated to sort of creating more connectivity between uh, Chinese government-owned telecoms and the private sector, things like hardware manufacturers as well as developers and creators. So we've seen in the last year three new uh, metaverse standard setting bodies in China or three new industry uh, sort of government uh, public-private industry associations created around the metaverse. Uh, one of them uh, was actually uh, was launched on November 11th, and uh, the launch of this organization was actually dubbed to be Metaverse Day in China. So November 11th is officially Metaverse Day in China. Um, it also happens to be a pretty big shopping day, a holiday, so I guess there's maybe some uh, some overlap there. Um, in, uh, I, I guess the, the one sort of name in, in VR in China that you might have heard of um, other than AWE Asia is the World Conference on Virtual Reality Industry. Uh, this uh, conference is, was started up in 2017 in Nanchang, uh, which is the capital of Jiangxi province in China. Um, so over the last couple of years, we've seen 321 projects uh, that are valued over $30 billion uh, start up from this Nanchang event and have been hosted in, uh, or you know, are based in Nanchang. So there was a real sort of uh, concerted government policy effort um, to make Nanchang essentially the VR town of China. 
And we've seen sort of these satellite uh, VR towns that's focused on specific uh, subsets of the VR industry pop up in the last couple of years as well. In particular, uh, the town of Beidou Bay, which is in uh, Guizhou province, um, it's uh, close to Guiyang, but not quite in the city. Um, this is a, a place that uh, was sort of designated as one of the places where China would manufacture a lot of VR headsets. Um, and over the last two years, uh, the, the sort of goal of being able to produce and manufacture 1.5 million VR headsets has actually has been actualized. We've seen other towns in different provinces in China take up and, and try to sort of uh, cast themselves as occupying a particular role in the VR industry. So for instance, uh, cities like Qingdao have tried to sort of cast themselves as one of the hubs of VR filming and entertainment. Um, Xi'an has tried to cast itself as a sort of industrial hub for, for VR in, ent in enterprise applications. Um, so we're seeing sort of different cities pioneer or sort of experiment and pilot different ways in which they can occupy a niche in XR. Um, on the other hand, regulators are a little nervous. There is a lot of new regulation that we're seeing around technology um, in the consumer internet in general in China, some new privacy laws that have uh, restricted the growth of, uh, of companies in China that focus on, uh, on, on the consumer internet in general. And we've definitely seen this apply to uh, VR as well. In particular, right after uh, ByteDance acquired Pico, there, were a, there was basically a uh, regulatory injunction that required that ByteDance uh, calm down or slow down the pace of its new acquisitions. Um, and we've seen a number of different uh, government policy initiatives that uh, restrict uh, video gaming in the last year. So now there's an extensive amount of regulations that prevent people who are under the age of 18 from being able to play video games. You can now, by a matter of law, only play video games as a minor for three hours a week, one hour on Friday, one hour on Saturday, one hour on Sunday. So of course, in XR land, we might wonder, well, this might slow down the growth of the space because naturally gaming is, is a pretty popular use case for XR. Um, we've also seen a glut of um, patent uh, applications and trademark, app trademark applications um, that uh, center around the term metaverse. There are now, uh, as of February, there were 16,000 company, company name or patent uh, name at, like uh, applications um, that were pending in, uh, inside China that centered around the term metaverse. And the authorities have increasingly become more cautious in approving that. Um, there's this sense that they don't want companies to speculate around the name metaverse um, and you know, take on a, a lot of funding without being able to deliver. Um, I encourage you guys to have a look at the white paper that we actually recently put out um, at the, uh, the start of this year, um, which wrapped up some other interesting data um, that were uh, some interesting survey data from AWA Asia, um, in particular, um, looking at levels of confidence in the XR space in China among Chinese companies um, before and after uh, in 2020 and 2021. Also looking at some major barriers to Sino-global cooperation um, in XR, uh, namely some, uh, some difficulties relating to the cost of localizing content and compatibility Compatibility issues and uh, the need for sort of international standard setting. Um, so um, there is, uh, I guess, the, the sort of thing that I would encourage everyone to think about is first, um, AWA Asia in 2022 is going to be taking place from August 26th to 27th in Shanghai. Um, if you are from China and plan on being back in the summer, we'd love to see you there. Or if you happen to have a Chinese representative office or colleagues who are based in China, we'd love to see them there. We welcome uh, hardware, software creators, uh, investors, and anyone else looking to uh, meet the folks in the AWA Asia community. Um, with that said, I'd like to thank everyone for joining us today. Um, I'd love to uh, take any questions you might happen to have over email. I do want to be respectful of the, uh, the next speakers, though. Um, so feel free to send me an email. I'm David at sunriseinspires.com. Would love to share a little bit more about what we're seeing in Asia, answer any questions you might have. With that said, thanks, everyone, and have a nice day.